conference on the future of technology and terrorism, and uh, hashtag we're not Skynet. Um, I want to welcome everyone. We're, we're going to do something a little different because we figured you're probably exhausted from presentations, and we don't want to exhaust you further. So we're going to have a, more of an informal fireside chat with both uh, Peter and Emerson. I have to tell you that it's a wonderful book. Um, I love the fact that the book explains how likes and lies are reshaping the nature of war. Um, I really particularly enjoyed, given my interest in terrorism and Jenna Jordan's interest in target assassination, that the book begins with the fact that one of the best kept secrets in DC, which was the target assassination of bin Laden, was actually ruined by some blogger complaining about all those helicopters making so much noise overhead. So I really did enjoy that the book really does bring everything together that we're interested in. And in particular, one of the things that tickled my fancy is that the much maligned uh, uh, Michael Flynn, General Michael Flynn, is kind of a hero in the book as having some amazing foresight <laughs> into how social media could be weaponized. So I'm going to just say thank you very much in advance for sticking with us to the end of the day. And it is my incredibly great pleasure to present to you uh, our keynote, Like War, The Weaponization of Social Media with Peter Singer and Emerson Brooking. Do you want me to? I'll, I'll begin uh, by adding in uh, my personal thanks, uh, and I assume on alongside of Emerson's for the kind invitation and hosting us for this conversation. And it really has hit so many interesting and important topics. Uh, as was noted, the flow of this is going to be a little bit different than your typical session. We're going to, in essence, interview each other, even though uh, we know each other, but kind of hit the highlights, uh, the kind of questions that most people have about the project. But to begin, we're actually going to kick it off with a short video uh, about what is like war. All right, so hello everyone. I wanted to start by echoing Peter's thanks. It's been awesome to be here today to see so many talented researchers in action. And uh, I'll kick off the conversation by asking Peter, what is like war? So the title of the book is a, a play on words like so much else in this space. Uh, and it has in essence two meanings. The first is uh, essentially a little over um, about a half century back, it's actually in the early 1960s, a memo went around the Pentagon. It was written uh, on paper in ink 
and it proposed the uh, somewhat crazy idea that computers could not just be big calculators, but they would be, in the words of the MO, quote, communication devices. And even more, these communication devices could be linked together into a, quote, intergalactic communication network. That memo, that proposal, uh, was actually believed. It was budgeted, and ARPANET, origin of the internet, was created. And since then, you had this space that was originally developed for science, then began to become a space for uh, communication, and became a business. And as we've heard, you know, through the the sessions um, throughout today. So quickly crossed with politics and war, and it became like a war zone. And anyone who's felt, whether looking at your Twitter or Facebook feed during some kind of an event like an election, but also it's something that's shaped um, terrorism and the like. You have battles going back and forth, so it feels like a war zone. But the second thing is uh, when we carried out this project of exploring uh, just what was going on, we quickly learned that it was not just like a war zone. Our argument is that it actually is a new mode of conflict itself. If you think of cyber war as hacking of networks, like war is the hacking of people on the networks by driving ideas viral through a mix of likes, shares, lies and the network's own algorithms. And what's interesting and just like what plays out in cybersecurity is that you might have wildly diverse actors. So in cybersecurity, you have you know, everything from teenager to hacktivists to criminals to uh, military officers, all using the same kind of tactics to breach a network. It's the same thing in like war, where here again, you might have teenagers and terrorists and uh, military officers using the very same tactics, the very same technologies to, in essence, hack something that's going on, be it to hack a vote, uh, to hack um, battlefield operations, uh, et cetera. So like war is this strange kind of space, and we'll get to this later, where, for example, we've heard a lot today about Junaid Hussein, where Junaid Hussein is using the very same tactics that Taylor Swift uses turn where uh, we see Russian military intelligence using the very same marketing tools that might be utilized to motivate someone to uh, go see a movie. And so it's a very strange space, but as those examples illustrate, these battles online shape real world behavior. Again, it's the behavior that uh, culminates in a terrorist campaign to a military operation to a you name it. Um, so, ping back to you, Emerson. Uh, what started us? Why write a book? So, the subtitle of our book is the weaponization of social media. I feel like that's a term that I'm seeing all over the news now, in the context of uh, like genocide in Myanmar, in uh, ongoing military conflicts, or in elections. Uh, but this term is also relatively it's very new. Um, Peter and I, uh, the genesis of this project was back in 2012. And uh, this was a time when basically no one was talking about the weaponization of social media, when everyone was still kind of feeling the high of the Arab Spring, uh, and uh, cyber utopians uh, were still basically the predominant force when we talked about the effects of the internet. But there were three events that kind of happened around the same time. Uh, there was. Uh, Operation Pillar of Defense, which was an eight-day conflict between the IDF and Hamas uh, in the fall of 2012. It was an inconclusive campaign, no different from many of the previous governments in the region, but it also was called the first Twitter war because this campaign saw some 10 million messages exchanged, uh, the vast majority of which were being written by people outside of the region. Uh, and then we hypothesized at the time that this was probably having some effects, at least on the IDF's uh, targeting behaviors. And as we've seen subsequently, uh, it did actually have those effects. Also around the same time, 
we see Alshbab, which is one of the first and most effective users of Twitter, launch uh, the Westgate mall attack in early 2013. This was a three-day occupation of a mall that was popular with Westerners. Uh, 67 people are killed. And what was remarkable, remarkable about this was that Shabab was live tweeting throughout the entire attack. Uh, they were continuing to put out updates, and even updates from within the besieged complex, while the Kenyan security forces were essentially silent. They left open this narrative space that Shabab happily seized. And as a consequence, they were able to shape the narrative surrounding it, and many Western reporters, facing an absence of information from official sources, turned to Shabab to inform their reporting, which, you know, if you're a terrorist organization plotting a theatrical attack, you couldn't ask for a better situation. And then the third thing that happened around this time uh, was that the US military began to relax its social media uh, regulations regarding use of these platforms while deployed. Uh, main reason for doing so is that service members could talk to their families. But it also, to us, as we were thinking through this, opened up fascinating new pathways where you might be in a situation where that uh, someone with whom you were in a state of conflict at war who you would attempt to kill if you saw them in person, you might find on a social media platform. They might find you. They might enter into a dialogue with you. And then it raised a whole bunch of fascinating questions. Uh, would this make conflict easier to prevent? Would it lead to some sort of new age Christmas truce as people in the field spoke to each other? Or would it actually lead to an escalation in uh, violence? These were all unanswered questions then. We have the hints of some of these answers now. But this is when Peter and I began digging into this topic. And as we were digging, uh, events kept apace and eventually outpaced, outpaced us. In the summer of 2014, Islamic State rises to public attention, becomes the predominant focus of the US national security establishment. Suddenly, the weaponization of social media is very big news. And uh, as we spoke about in earlier panels here, issues like uh, terrorist exploitation of these platforms, content moderation policies, were suddenly the focus of conversation in DC. Uh, then continuing, we started work on this book. We are about to wrap it up. Then the 2016 election happens. Uh, Donald Trump, although in all conventional measure, was significantly behind Clinton, nonetheless wins in large part because of his Twitter handle and because of his savvy online organizing. It made us realize that many of the uh, methods that we were tracking in the context of terrorism and violent actors were equally applicable to political campaigns. And indeed, if you, uh, if you looked at the way that a savvy political campaign organized itself, it wasn't much different from an asymmetric online actor that was using political violence. So we shift again. We expand our focus, and over the time that we were working, uh, it becomes apparent that also the Russian Federation had a significant influence over the election, and in fact was using its own manipulation to affect US voter sentiment. And then as we were finally wrapping up a second time, we saw the violent uh, white nationalist rally in Charlottesville in August 2017, when a protester was killed, which was another example of uh, a movement that many of us thought was gone forever from the public space that suddenly saw a drastic resurgence. Thanks to, again, that same sort of online organization and mobilization that wouldn't have been possible a few years ago. So as we've tracked this subject, this subject has grown infinitely more vast. But I, uh, Peter, I hope you could talk a bit more about our research methodology. Sure, so one of the issues that we saw playing out to uh, carry out this project was the fact that for a space that was networked, it was incredibly stovepiped. And that's why uh, we were often missing things that were going on. So people that were interested in terrorism or the Middle East were not familiar with uh, Russian information operations. Or in turn, people were uh, familiar in tracking uh, Russian disinformation operations uh, were not lashed up with uh, American domestic politics. So things that uh, Russia had done in Ukraine that were quite familiar, uh, campaign beat reporters uh, or a political scientist who do you know, American studies and the like were missing uh, and misunderstanding what was happening. Uh, you also had 
disconnects between people who uh, did the, the quant side, the big data mapping, uh, a lot of which we've seen here, versus those that use other research methodologies, uh, be it archival. Uh, so going back into history, uh, whether it's military history or history of terrorism, to, you know, the first uh, stories, recorded stories of terrorists, uh, you know, the, the, the knife um, uh, squares in Judea, to like, like psychology, economics, you name it. Um, and then also uh, you had this disconnect between kind of time and um, uh, the primary methodology that journalists use, which is interviews. Uh, so the people that are doing the big data mapping or the archive weren't going out and meeting uh, and talking with uh, the direct array of people that are in this space. So we, for example, interviewed everything from the little Godfather of the internet uh, himself, to technology company executives, to recruiters, extremists, uh, to celebrities, to members of the military. Uh, there was special operations, to, as uh, Mia mentioned, um, recently retired three star generals who uh, had insights into uh, intelligence operations and how it had changed, but also some really interesting insights into how to become an internet troll and conspiracy theorist and later uh, guilty to the FBI for lying. Um, so this methodology of bringing together all of these different sources, we felt like uh, gave us a way of uh, approaching something that's really difficult in this space, which is the truth of the matter, uh, by coming at it from multiple different angles. So the question to um, swing back to you, Emerson, is, uh, what we discover? What are the rules of like war? Well, Peter, I think this is working. Uh, all right. The yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be easier. All right. Um, so the first, speaking of the truth, the truth is out there. The old uh, X Files tagline. We're on track by 2020 to have some 20 billion. All right, we're on track to have some 20 billion uh, smart devices connected to the Internet of Things out there by the end of 2020, all of which have sensors, all of which are continuously collecting data and metadata. Uh, the result is essentially, if something happens, there's some digital record of it. And increasingly, uh, it's hard to maintain operational secrecy even contemporaneous with an op operation, much less afterward. As we alluded to briefly, the 2011 uh, Operation Neptune Spear to get Osama bin Laden, the most secretive operation in US military history. Fewer than 100 people read into the full extent of it uh, in a million person US national bureaucracy, uh, where most of these people are in the same famous situation room Photo, photograph, watching this video link as two specially equipped Black Hawk helicopters fly into about a bad uh, SEAL Team 6, repels down, everyone's seen Zero Dark Thirty. Um, the fact that a night owl IT consultant is nonetheless kept up by these helicopters, nonetheless provides a contemporaneous account which is instantly corroborated once President Obama announces that bin Laden's been killed, that he then, this poor Pakistani guy, tweets, uh-oh, I'm the guy who live tweeted the mission to get Osama bin Laden, and who to this day is accused of being an intelligence agent of the ISI, of Al Qaeda, or of the US government, alternately, because people just can't believe that he somehow recorded this, even incidentally. But the fact is he did. He just was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And this was back in 2011, at a time when Pakistan had an internet penetration rate of only about 4%. It's up to, uh, I think, about 30 or 40 percent now. And soon Southeast Asia will be about as connected as the West is now. So we're looking at a radically different information environment where traditional state secrecy no longer holds. But just because the truth's out there doesn't mean you can find it. In response, uh, states and actors of all sorts have moved to an alternate form of censorship, which is coordinated disinformation campaigns. The truth's out there, but what if you could sow 10 or 20 false narratives? It doesn't matter if the narratives are internally contradictory. 
It just matters that there are so many possible explanations for an event out there that you can maintain some plausible deniability even as people try to move toward a particular explanation. A great example here is the 2014 downing of Malaysian flight MH17 over uh, eastern Ukraine by Russia-backed separatists. It was clear and proven repeatedly by open source reporting and available data that this was the work of Russian-backed separatists. But the Russian government has danced be between now over a dozen different contradictory storylines. They've uh, uh, photo photoshopped satellite images that show a Ukrainian jet shooting the passenger plane down. They've suggested it was a Ukrainian uh, service-to-air missile. They've alluded alternately to high conspiracies by either Ukrainian security forces or, of course, the CIA. Again, the logic doesn't matter. What matters is these disinformation campaigns. And this is important because the third takeaway here, in this new environment, attention is the only thing that matters. Attention and virality. If you achieve, capture, and maintain hold of attention, it doesn't matter if what you're saying is true or not. You can, uh, I'll give you a great example, you can have a, a fabricated battle that's played out in Syria or Iraq, and it's happened, which will be extensively reported on and will seem to be real, even though its underlying facts are not true. Concurrently, if you don't have people pushing a real event in the region, then it doesn't have that strategic effect. You now have an information environment that has real political power, but you don't have to tell the truth in it. And the consequence is what we describe as like war, this continuous battle of narratives, this nonstop information campaign that overlays the physical fight. Interestingly, though, this battlefield is not like land, air, or sea. It doesn't abide by neutral rules like gravity. Instead, it's, it abides by algorithms that are written by a handful of unelected engineers in Silicon Valley. And as a result, these companies have accumulated immense political power. One of the most interesting political and social revolutions we've seen over the last two years is Silicon Valley, and principally Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, coming reluctantly to terms with this political power. But as we'll discuss, there's a long way to go. And the, the final takeaway, the final rule of like war, is to understand that you are part of these fights, these information conflicts, whether you choose to be or not. Because there's no, there's no wall in place between a, a smart viral marketing campaign for pizza and, uh, say, a terrorist propaganda campaign to try to command attention. You are there, therefore a target of dozens or hundreds of these skirmishes. And because oftentimes the people conducting these skirmishes can lurk behind false identities or botnets or sock puppets, uh, you may never know their true motivations. So this is truly a conflict in which we are all part. And uh, now, back to you, Peter, if virality is the only thing that matters, how do we achieve it? What, one thing I would add of why um, virality trumps veracity uh, is what plays out on these networks um, that are driven by that kind of design uh, hits other realms in ways that we often don't appreciate. So sometimes in audiences, people will say, well, but I'm, I'm not online. I'm, I'm, I'm not on Facebook or Twitter or whatnot. Uh, however, over 90% of journalists use social media to determine what stories to cover, what angle to take on the story, who to interview for the story, and then based on its performance, whether it's trending online or not, whether to revisit that story again with more coverage. So uh, if you are listening to talk radio or reading the newspaper or watching the evening news, even if you're not online, you're being shaped by these battles. In fact, you're maybe being shaped more. Uh, but in these, um, when we looked at whether something went viral or not, we found a consistency uh, in terms of whether you were talking about Pizzagate conspiracy theory or uh, pizza rat jokes, uh, Russian disinformation, ISIS propaganda, uh, marketing for movies, you name it. 
when things went viral, they consistently had the same set of five attributes, and they were attributes that were often engineered into them. They were deliberately planned. Uh, and you know, I'm not gonna break down all of them, but I'll, I'll hit one that uh, illustrates something that we've been talking about in a number of panels, and I referenced it earlier, is we kept talking about Janet Hussein um, in terms of his hacking skills, uh, but that's not what moved him up to number three on the airstrike target list, uh, it was his ability to recruit and motivate online. Um, so, and part of what he did was a very similar tactic that, as I referenced earlier, Taylor Swift did. Uh, they both um, realized that social media provided a new kind of communication revolution that brought together two types of the past. So if you were thinking about everything from the telegraph to television, essentially communication revolutions either connected two people at a distance, so the story of the telegraph, or they allowed one person to reach many in a new type of way, whether that's the printing press or radio or TV. With social media, they're finally combined together. And so um, Taylor Swift was among uh, the first in the realm of celebrity and more important business to realize this. And she engages in something that she calls Tay lurking. And essentially, she gathers intelligence uh, at the most intimate personal level about what people are doing in their lives. Uh, so it might be anything from uh, someone uh, passes a driver's license, uh, to they break up with a boyfriend, to uh, they wear a cool t-shirt. Uh, she's able to observe this about people, and she does so. It really is her tracking what's going on. And then she reaches down and personally engages them like a friend would do. Congratulations on passing your driver's license. Oh, you broke up. Don't worry, it'll get better. That's a really cool shirt you're wearing. And in this kind of personal engagement, she's not just like a friend, she is their friend in the new meaning of the term. But she's doing it in full knowledge that the rest of the world is watching. So it's this notion of planned authenticity. Um, and it was much the same thing that Junaid Hussein would do, where essentially he would gather information and then reach out and individually engage people. And uh, that engagement, instead of um, winning hearts and minds to go to a Taylor Swift conference, it was winning hearts and minds to go to Syria or conduct an act of terrorism. I just came back from Texas. Um, and so it was that that put uh, him on the top of the targeting list, higher than uh, pretty much everything, uh, every one of uh, all but two of um, ISIS's members, whether it's battlefield commanders, terrorist coordinators, you name it. Uh, and so understanding these attributes of what drives things viral, there's other ones, you know, uh, Emerson referenced uh, narrative, another one is building fellowship, but kind of understanding them is the real key to victory in this space. Okay. Uh, last question, Emerson, before we turn it over to the audience. What can we do? What are the policy answers? Uh, what are the personal answers uh, to this? So the big overarching answer here is to begin to think about the, the spread of this, this engineered information. Uh, and mostly it's, it's misinformation. It's, it's information that's uh, you know, most folks spread it on because it's, it's interesting or enticing, um, but it has a deleterious effect over society. Um, to, to begin to think about the spread of this engineered information as contagion, as a public health crisis. Uh, just think about the terminology we use when something gets momentum in the information environment. We say it's going viral. Um, the way these engineered information works, oftentimes, is that it, it targets the most credulous and vulnerable in a community, which uh, we have new evidence now that shows that's, that's people over the age of 65. In fact, a uh, good takeaway for any Gen Z and millennials here, uh, folks over 65 are seven times more vulnerable to false storylines than those aged uh, 18 to 29. So, like a virus, uh, this information attacks the most vulnerable, but once it's entered a social network, it becomes much easier for it to spread among people who would be uh, originally a bit more skeptical about it. The cause for this is another term I'll leave you with called homophily. It means love of the same, but it's a very basic human desire 
uh, human instinct to place more trust when information is shared by someone in our social network. Homophily is generally a good thing. Trust is how societies are built. But the internet short circuits this process because instead of your social network being uh, you know, your family and a few folks down the street, it can be thousands of people. They can be all, spread all over the world and you may have never met them in person. You may not be aware of their true motivations. But basically, once your credulous person shares something into that network, then it begins to spread. And we now see abundant evidence that misinformation, if acted on, uh, you know, it, it sparks civil violence. It uh, sparks conflicts. It is responsible for genocides. It may one day start wars. So we have to think about the spread of information as a public health crisis. And so from the perspective of government, uh, we have to have mechanisms in place to alert people when there's a big mis or disinformation campaign. We have to invest, the same way we invested in public health, health schooling, we have to invest in media literacy programs. And what's ironic here is that right now we spend millions of dollars a year in places like Ukraine and uh, the Baltic states to fund media literacy programs to counter disinformation from Russia. But we don't do the same here in the U.S. And in fact, to even bring up these questions is, uh, in the current environment, uh, uh, essentially politically infeasible. As we've been giving talks on different aspects of information manipulation uh, to government and military audiences, it's usually people who come up afterward, kind of like in whispered tones, who want to talk about it. Because, essentially, the White House has set a tone whereby you can't focus critically on these issues because the do so is to call into question the president's democratic mandate. So there's a lot that government can do. There are some things, as I said, that we can do. And the last piece is to consider the role of Silicon Valley. Uh, over the course that we were writing the book, we saw a remarkable transformation in the Valley. And I'll use Facebook as an example. Shortly after the 2016 election, Mark Zuckerberg says, you know, it's a crazy thing to think that Facebook had an influence over the way the election turned out, or that it had influence over politics. Well, you could go back a few weeks and see that Facebook was advertising aggressively with political campaigns. We can have an effect over politics. So this didn't really last for long. Uh, but in the, in the months and years since, it's been kind of the Kubler-Ross stages of grief, where it's gone uh, from a denial to a gradual, painful path journey toward acceptance. A, uh, a little over a year after the election, Facebook puts out a strident uh, public document which accuses the Russian Federation of misusing the platform for the purposes of attacking our election system. It was, in fact, at this point, a more vocal document than what we were seeing from the US government. So there's been almost a kind of role reversal. Now, there's still bigger questions to come. That is, uh, how much political power should these companies wield? To use Facebook again, Facebook right now has 2.3 billion users. Facebook plus Instagram and WhatsApp is about 2.7 billion users. Facebook is significantly bigger than any country. It's the second biggest continent after the Asia Pacific, and it has, has eclipsed Christianity as the largest religion in the world. So these are things to consider as we think about the role that these companies should have, the extent to which they should be regulated, and uh, just how we should manage our relationship with them and how they should manage their relationship with nations across the world as we figure out how to deal with this new information challenge. And with that, I will open it to questions. But Peter, do you have anything to add? I want to hit a, a couple issues in terms of the policy side. Um, real quickly, uh, breaking it down, government, business, individual. On the government side, the United States may have been the nation that invented the internet. We are now the nation that military officers and government leaders and other democracies point to as don't let that happen to us. They specific, you know, even Swedish officers will talk that way. Um, part of uh, a major gap on the governmental side is not just the um, uh, active denial, pun intended, uh, of the scale of the problem, but we also don't have a strategy. It took us 15 years uh, as a nation to finally get a cybersecurity strategy. We got it just uh, a couple months earlier. Yay, it had nothing on this entire realm. 
boo. Uh, so without a strategy, you can't figure out everything from uh, you know how to budget for it, how to organize for it, uh, in particular not just within the military, but across all the other agencies from DHS to, uh, if you're talking about digital literacy, that moves into Department of Education. And that's why you've seen kind of this haphazard response, um, uh, whether it's to issues of uh, extremism, uh, in particular white nationalism, uh, to defending US elections, where maybe Cyber Command is forward leaning, Department of Education is absent without leave. On the corporate side, um, again, uh, you have this sense of denial. They're kind of caught between denial and bargaining in those stages of grief, uh, where, for example, you can imagine a very different world where um, the companies were engaging in uh, what we would call red teaming, where they were testing how bad actors might use their products rather than waiting for the bad thing to happen and then belatedly responding to it. Uh, or it might be how good actors might misuse their products. So a great illustration of this is um, uh, Live Feed. Uh, Facebook it was surprised that um, terrorists were using it to broadcast their killings. Uh, teenagers were using it to broadcast their suicides. Anyone who knew anything about either teenagers or terrorists could have predicted this. Um, a different example of them wrestling with uh, the kind of sense of responsibility that they have, not merely as technology companies, but now as media companies in terms of policing content, would go back to that example of um, white nationalism. Uh, they this issue is played out across the network. We know that um, uh, far-right extremist groups have killed more Americans than members of um, ISIS have. And we've personally had engagements with them uh, on, you know, why are you not doing more? Uh, and in particular, you know, example would be um, screening out symbology, where they will screen out ISIS black flags, but we're not doing that for uh, things like 1488. Um, uh, and they essentially said a mix of we can't do it technically and we ought not to do it. And then just a couple weeks ago, after the mass killing in Christchurch, they changed their mind. So they didn't change their mind after Pittsburgh, but they did change their mind after Christchurch. So they've got to get out of this sense of denial, and part of this would be doing active red teaming. They would be identifying these problems and developing solutions to them beforehand. And then finally, um, the responsibility of equipping us to better defend ourselves. Imagine a very different uh, experience with the platforms where they were pushing you tutorials the way they do in cybersecurity. So if you're a user of Facebook, or Instagram and the like, uh, over the last year, it started to push you things like, hey, do you know you can also register your cell phone? This is two-factor uh, authorization. This is a better way of getting cybersecurity. They don't have pop-ups on, here's how you might better defend yourself from these viral outbreaks that Emerson mentioned. Um, so just a couple more important things that we just wanted to push out there. So let's uh, um, open it up now. Yes, we've, we've got another uh, mic, uh, so please, hands up, fire away. Um, so, I mean, I know you, you were talking about, you know, how do we sort of deal with this, like, public health issue, as you framed it, um, I don't know if the exact words that you used, but something like that. And so, you know, I, I mean, I feel like it's, you've got such huge issues, like, how do we deal with this? And so what I was sort of wondering, I mean, it seems like if so much of it's based on misinformation and people believing things that aren't true, but it seems like it's sort of akin to thinking about, you know, a counter-ideological um, response to dealing with terror, you know, how do we deal with different kinds of military groups? Well, maybe we do counter ideological messaging, but that's notoriously hard. Governments are really bad at it. Um, and so how do we get people to, I mean, it is kind of an ideological shift in a way to get people to believe, to, to not believe things that they truly do believe, but rather than just saying, oh, this isn't true or this isn't true, but like, it seems like it requires something more fundamental in some ways. And I think related to that is thinking about how do governments deal with that? Because as you mentioned, right, you know, there's, you've got the private industry that's in this, right, tech companies and the government, and you know, coordination is difficult. And so it seems like it's going to require kind of a coordinated effort. And I mean, you know, 
private sector and governments are notoriously have problems working together, but even within the government, you've got lots of different people that have a stake in these kinds of issues, and getting coordination on that level seems hard. So I think it's kind of a two-part question. Sorry, it was a bit long. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. I'll, I'll jump on it first. And then, um, so one, I, I like the parallel that you also made, um, because in terms of public health, there's a parallel to uh, the way that anti-vaxxer conspiracy theory has spread across this space um, and had real world physical effects. And it's also a great example of the companies kind of wrestling with their responsibilities. So for essentially 15 years, they were okay with it. And again, um, as political winds changed a couple months ago, they changed policy and said, now we're no longer allowing it. Um, and you know, it's, we, what we're getting at is that uh, we do see action when you have the combination of either customer demand and or the fear of government intervention. Um, now, the second thing that I would say is you sort of said, how do we solve this? Um, you wouldn't say that about terrorism. You wouldn't say that about public health. You wouldn't say that about cybersecurity. Instead, we need to understand this is a space where there is no silver bullet solution. There's no silver bullet. Exactly as you laid it out, you need action by government, private sector, individuals. Um, again, just because we have a uh, CDC does not mean that um, I don't need to wash my hands, right? Or in cybersecurity, just because we have a cyber command doesn't mean that my mom uh, shouldn't have a good password on her bank account. Uh, so the same thing in this space, we need uh, multiple actors. That's part of what's missing. Um, when we look at nations that do really well in this, like the Estonians, they have that kind of strategic whole of society approach. We don't yet have that. And the other is that notion of um, no solution. Uh, as long as there is an internet, as long as there is politics, this, these battles will be happening. Instead, it's about us being you know, savvy players in them. And um, so then, once we approach that, then we can do everything from uh, you know, make it harder on the adversary by throwing friction into their operations, making the targets less vulnerable. Uh, sometimes it's ideological pushback, but it's ideological pushback that's effective pushback. So, you know, a great example of this is the every, you know, whether the adversary is a political campaign or ISIS, I go, they lied. And so here's the facts, here's the numbers. That's not going to work. Um, instead, it's things like, for example, turn it into a narrative, um, a mystery of where did this uh, network that's pushing the false story come from, engage the audience, build a fellowship around it. So again, you know, it, it's, uh, it's much like what's played out in, again, the realm of counterterrorism or cybersecurity or public health. We need this multifaceted approach, but we've also got to get out of that active denial of this is a problem, it's a real problem, and we're not very good at it as a nation. So uh, the framing here is tough because we, well, we're at a conference predominantly about the future of terrorism, and you used the start uh, terrorism counter narratives frame, but this broader misinformation problem is almost entirely based in civil society, and it's not against the law to have crazy views so long as they don't translate into civil violence. And when we're talking about misinformation, it often doesn't translate into violence. Um, the thing to really think about is that all these, these crazy views and this uh, susceptibility to false stories, uh, this didn't spring from nowhere. This has always been part of our society. The difference is the technology, the medium. Uh, the capability to not only speak instantaneously to anyone else in the world, but to broadcast that speech to tens of millions of people. Uh, it's fundamentally different from previous communications mediums. Where before, if you were thinking about radio or television broadcast, uh, you might send information out there, but it would go through a series of gatekeepers, being reporters and editors. Uh, if the information was blatantly false, you would append a fact check there would be systems in place to slow its spread, but all those systems are absent now. So this is just speaking for myself, as I've begun to think more about how we as a society handle this, this problem, I think it comes from uh, these social media companies that have developed these platforms being 
increasingly restrictive in the way their system works and the speed at which information transits. Because if you think about one problem, which lies at the base of so many of our examples today, uh, like say the uh, genocide against the Rohingya, uh, the problem is speed. The problem is information moving faster than any, anyone can process it, than any government can formulate a response. If you can begin to build, say, breaks into the algorithms that govern these systems and to increasingly restrict, unfortunately, their functionality, I think that's the best way to actually get at a solution. But many other solutions are anathema, and rightfully anathema, to uh, liberal democracy. Uh, we, we often say that China doesn't have the same problem because China has complete infrastructural and social control over the information that transits the internet. The nation in the world that's most immune to misinformation and all its bad effects is North Korea because no one has internet access and there are a few dozen websites on the national internet. Um, so those are just things to consider as we think about the immensity of this challenge. Okay, so I had a quick question. And then what I wanted to say is, uh, after you guys answer me, if you have a copy of Like War that you want um, um, Emerson and Peter to sign, what I would say is take your copies, line up, because after my question, they can sign them because we are going to have to let Peter catch a flight. So here's the question I have. There's been a discussion ever since New Zealand after what Brenton Tarrant did to disable Facebook Live. But for every Tarrant instance we have, we have a Fernando Castile. So the question is, how do we balance the benefits of being able to see in real time um, oppression or violations of people's individual human rights as juxtaposed with the way that you presented that this becomes a tool both for suicidal teenagers and terrorists. Thank you. Sure. Uh, that's an amazing question and another essentially intractable issue. I, uh, so as we think about the, the good that social media has done and still can do, and we kind of uh, contrast it with now the, the virulent movements that it's also at the core of, an important thing to think about, when you think about what gains viral momentum, uh, the galvanizing force is almost always outrage. In the Arab Spring, it was video of uh, atrocities committed by uh, Ali and Mubarak. Uh, with Black Lives Matter, it was specific police shooting videos. These things help form protests which can affect real political change. But the problem is that outrage is kind of a, it, it's a, it's a drug that gives a high only briefly, and then you need more and more outrage. If we think about what happened in the case of the Arab Spring, you have millions of Egyptians flooding Tahir Square. Uh, they accomplished their goal. They have effectively mobilized via Facebook. But then the minute they accomplish that goal, uh, what do they do then? They fragment, but they still have that same online mobilization. But now these, these groups that are still just as organized turn against each other, and the new flashpoints become incidents that basically turn them against each other. So they became, uh, essentially they were put into a point of stasis, a perpetual conflict among themselves, which led to the election of Morsi, as you saw a significant boycott of the election, and then in turn the rise of a new autocrat worse than Mubarak was. So it's my sense that in the long run, this, this powerful mobilizing force of outrage, I think it generally benefits bad actors more because they're the ones who are more willing to bend the truth and to continually feed this population that they use as a political base to accomplish, uh, say, look at the Philippines, Brazil, the United States, increasing uh, goals that look increasingly like some sort of a, a autocratic end. My sense then, and Peter might have a different opinion, is that this stuff does benefit the bad actors more. So as we consider Facebook Live, um, I would heavily restrict its use, and I would at least probably see it put on a moratorium while significant investments were made in the sort of automated uh, neural network-based policing that could ensure that there isn't another New Zealand-style uh, broadcast. 
I might be in a slightly different place on that, but it um, circles back to what we were talking about of uh, the companies being in denial. And part of how they're approaching this uh, is uh, they think they can find a technology solution to the problem that you laid out, which is a political problem. Uh, and there's a great quote in the book. Um, I'm going to kind of mangle it, but roughly it's from an engineer at one of the leading technology companies who uh, says, you know, AI is uh, going to be able to solve all of this as long as we work out the First Amendment issues. And you're like, you know, we're always going to have First Amendment issues, right? You, you can't automate that, but that's what they're going to. And that's why I keep saying um, in, in denial, it's not just in denial of the ills, it's in denial of the type of company that you are. So they are no longer technology companies. They are now media companies and kind of public utilities. And that's where my direct answer to you in terms of the solution lies. Media companies have always intervened to decide what is newsworthy or not and what is allowed or not. And they use lots of different standards for that. And some of these apply over to the social media companies of deciding, you know, maybe this depicts an act of violence, but the act of violence is newsworthy because it's not being weaponized. Um, a different example of a tell in this space is um, when something goes viral, is it authentically going viral or is it being driven? And most importantly, the great thing about the internet is, as um, uh, Emerson said earlier, one of the rules is uh, the truth is always out there, is that you can backtrack who is pushing it. So the who is pushing it matters. If we think about the New Zealand thing, it was basically a, a small set of easy to identify toxic actors. So, you know, that matters. It's a similar version if you think about Pizzagate. Um, we, one of the biggest political changes though, is that um, it's, it's government starting to weigh in in a manner that, um, again, whether it was fire insurance to cybersecurity to now content moderation, initially it's business, you do this yourself, we're not going to intervene, it might chill innovation, et cetera, to now you're starting to see regulation. Um, and the regulation uh, debate is um, happening in, uh, you know, in the wake of this uh, everywhere from Britain to Canada to Australia, uh, all similar kind of democracies have uh, pushed forward legislation that says companies you're going to either face fines or in Australia it's a pitch that even company executives might be jailed if the, something goes viral that essentially is um, hits the definition of what you were talking about. Uh, I don't know where it's going to resolve itself, but what I do know is that uh, we're going to see this be a continuing issue uh, in a way that, for example, it wasn't during the 2016 election. So you had this strangeness of the 2016 election shaped by like war, but no one was talking about whether to break up the companies or should, they, should there be enforced content moderation or not. In the 2020 election, not just in the United States, but in ones in Europe and the like, it's going to be a point of discussion. It's going to be in 2024, et cetera. Um, it's not going away. And that means we all need to, again, better understand this space because we are, most of the people in this room are researchers whose topics all are now shaped by it, uh, but we are also individual participants in these conflicts. Uh, and you know, as Emerson was laying out, we can either be unwitting participants, which means we will be taken advantage of, and even more so, those people in our networks will be taken advantage of, or we can be players that are pushing uh, this more towards the positive impact of social media rather than the negative side. So, so we'll come on down. I just want to uh, thank you again for allowing us to join.